Hello, creeps. It's me, John Kassir, the voice of the Crypt Keeper, and you're listening to Chronicles from the Crypt. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Casualty Chris. And this is Father Malone. And we are the hosts of Chronicles from the Crypt, a twice a month look at the horror anthology series Tales from the Crypt that aired on HBO from 1989 to 1996. But I think I can speak for both of us at this point, Father Malone. Maybe 1996 was a year too far? Uh, Definitely. Let's say season seven was a season too far. And on this episode of Chronicles from the Crypt, we're going to be taking a look at what is ultimately our penultimate episode of this show, talking about Tales from the Crypt, at least, at least the show proper. Season 7, episode 9 and 10, Smoke Rings and About Face. They tell me Luca Brasi sleeps with a fishes. He's a strange guy. But that's not why I called this meeting of the five families. The Tahaklias. The Bone Eddies. The others. The reason I called you all together is this. As godfather of the Gorleone family, I say it's time that we and her organized crime stop fighting each other. I want there to be peace amongst us. I want there to be a whole lot of pieces. <laughs> Which is kind of like the young man in tonight's tale. He wants a whole lot of something, too. In a nasty nugget I call Smoke Rings. So Smoke Rings aired June 21st, 1996. It is directed by Mandy Fletcher, written by Lisa Sandoval, and... It stars a lot of folks, but the ones that you're going to recognize right off the bat are going to be Daniel Craig and one of my favorite character actors, as I know you like him as well, Paul Freeman. Oh, Oh, I love love Paul Freeman. Not in this. (laughs) Also, Dennis Lawson's great. Wedge Antilles. Yeah, I was going to say, from some known much more from something else. Yeah, Wedge Antilles from Star Wars. So, Father Malone... Again, we kind of let the cat out of the bag that maybe season seven has not been going that well, uh, maybe being a very light term. What did you think of the Daniel Craig episode of this season? Because we've been talking about it, like, oh, the, this is the episode with Daniel Craig. You know, what did you think of the Daniel Craig episode? This was my first experience with the particular episode. Um It's one of those episodes that uh, whenever somebody will publish like a retrospective of the show, like they'll include a photograph of him from it. And I always think, wow, Daniel Craig was in an episode. That probably was pretty good. That's incorrect. This episode is not very good. Uh, He's okay in it. Uh, All the acting actually is uh, pretty much across the board good. Yeah, it is the plot of this episode that actively works against it. It really does. And uh, so let me just say Smoke Rings is not based on Tales from the Crypt. It's based on A Vault of Horror, number 34, written by Al Feldstein and art by Reed Crandall. It is similar in that it's about an advertising firm. In the comic, however, it's a guy who approaches a female copywriter at an ad agency because he has a great idea for a a new way to advertise a billboard for cigarettes that actually shoots out smoke rings to grab the attention of people. And she thinks it's a great idea. So she leads him on that she's going to sell the idea and then they're going to split the money. But really, she just wants the money for herself. So most of the comic is her just constantly convincing him that everything is still on the up and up when it's not until the point where they've built the billboard and the guy isn't going to take it anymore. He knows that she's trying to screw him. So they meet at the billboard itself and the smoke rings that come out of the billboard are made from steam, which there's a giant vat in a uh, little warehouse kind of structure underneath the billboard. That's where the, the steam vessel is the the giant thing of water which she tosses him into to get rid of him and then the next day they're unveiling the billboard and they have her up there and the first smoke ring comes out and it just kind of envelops her and kills her so there's only the only way to go when adapting this particular comic is up unless of course you make what we had to watch (laughs) 
<laughs> they somehow made it worse. Uh yeah. No, this is this is one of these episodes where at the end of it I look back and say, what was even the point of telling this story? And look, we've taken a lot of flack and we're gonna continue to take a lot of flack because this podcast will exist until the imminent heat death of this planet, but we have taken a lot of flack on this show at least from people who listen to this show, for, you know, we don't like the show. We don't care about the show. We're not fans of the show. You know, blindly liking something because it's the show and not being able to view it critically is worse than being critical of something. And I'm, I'm, what am I leading to with all of this? This season of the show is awful with a capital A. A. We have seen very few, if any, episodes so far this season that are redeemable. They have all been the worst versions of things we've seen before. And this episode is right there in a long list of episodes where it's twist first, everything else doesn't matter. Character development? Nope. Interesting dialogue? Nope. Interesting scenes? Nope. Gore and other visuals? Nope. Like, what? why, why are we even here now? Why are, why are we here watching this show if the show has stopped respecting our time you know we've said this probably a couple times now that it does feel like the material for this season is just the leftovers from the previous seasons that they just opened the trunk and and pulled these out Uh, i i maintain that that's what happened which is a drag because this is the last season and they felt like we didn't deserve better but also a drag because You find out that you're going to get one more season and it's going to be in England and removed from everything. And now you could actually take all the risks in the world. This is, you know, this is going to be the last season. So, like, you know, blow it out. Like, make it insane. Instead, we're getting the filler episodes from previous seasons instead of what could have been a spectacular, bloody, gory end to the Tales from the Crypt franchise. They, you know, a Viking funeral instead of just a, a, a somber cremation. And, and you know, that's the sad reality is that this they just kind of let this show die. Died on the vine. Right? But let's, let's talk about the episode itself. Obviously, they use the comic more than not as far as somebody who got screwed over by an ad agency and getting revenge. It's the same basic plot. Here we have Paul uh, Paul Freeman, who, you know, was fired and stepped over and he needs to get back at these people. So he's invented a device that subliminally makes people crave whatever object you're offering them which is a great tool for advertising. And instead of just going to any ad agency in the world and saying, I'll sell this to you for $10 million or a billion dollars, he uses it in this petty revenge scheme. And he doesn't even do it himself. I mean, he uses a proxy, which is the Daniel Craig character. And then, as you said, Chris, it's just like they're so caught up and we have to have a twist and a twist and a twist that... I don't know. It's just laughable in a way. And and at the same time, not. But that does represent something that I kind of hate in stories like this, Revenge or Not, where somebody is has invented a device that is like so revolutionary that they would be rich beyond their wildest dreams. And instead they use it for as just a plot device for the story we're seeing. It's really dumb. I wish people would stop doing that. And then on top of everything else, it's a twist within a twist. Yeah. Who's, who's double crossing who? Oh, and then it turns out that Paul Freeman's character actually is in on it because they're testing the new device, the secret device that they were actually testing on Daniel Craig when he was supposed to be testing the device that Paul Freeman gave him. No, no, stop. Yeah. You're you're dragging yourself into a hole of your own creation. You are downward spiraling so hard, show, with your incomprehensible, convoluted storylines that go nowhere, that are now just attempting to salvage name value of the, the series by still, you know, copying the titles of old Vault of Horror stories. Yeah, like, I've got this device, and I think it could be a real winner. We need to test it out. I'll pretend to be a guy who lives in these steam tunnels, and we'll find a criminal who's really charming, and we'll go through this big charade. Like, what the hell? Are you kidding? No. It's very convoluted. And yeah, Daniel Craig is the best part of the episode, but that's because he's not, I mean, he's not given much to do, but he's the character you see the most. It's because it's Daniel Craig. He's, he's a movie star for a reason. Like, uh, I, the, I, the sad thing about, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of Daniel Craig, but I think that's because of the, most of the roles that Daniel Craig has played. The writing is not great, i.e. James Bond. But I will agree with you. He's a charismatic actor. Um, 
he's more charismatic in this than he is in a lot of the Bond movies, um, which is funny given how important charisma is to that character. But that character that Bond that is that Craig plays as Bond is a charismatic less black hole intentionally. Um, but he is a charismatic actor, and it shows in this. But even his charisma can't save this episode. No, nothing could save this episode. It's rotted from the core, which is a, a dumb idea uh, just to, you know, waste 22 minutes of time. Like, you know, there, you know it's it, there's nothing supernatural in it, which is, as anyone who's listened to the show knows, I prefer. And that's fine. It's not even a real love triangle. It's just, I don't know, it's poor. It's poor. And it's a story that ultimately goes nowhere. There is no payoff. There is no... You know, earned twist. The twist is very lazy. It's not good. No. Sorry, England. So let's move on to the next episode. About face. My girl thinks I'm a vampire. So she eats garlic just in case. Man, she smells. Yeah, my ghoul thinks I'm a vampire. Lives at me when we embrace. I said, babe, I'm no bloodsucker. What the smile right off a face. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> now I'd like to play for you another little rhythm and booze decomposition of mine. It's about a man who's about to make a good progression of his own. And a nasty five-finger hacksercise, I call About Face. So About Face aired June 28th, 1996. It is directed by Thomas E. Sanders. The screenplay is by Gilbert Adler, A.L. Katz, and Larry Wilson. And the uh, kind of the biggest actor of note in this is Imelda Staunton. Yeah. Who would go on to be uh, Dolores Umbridge in Harry Potter. <laughs> uh, yeah, which another uh, another Britain connection there, obviously, again, with the show being filmed in England during the time. Uh, what did you think of this episode, Father Malone? Uh, it's an improvement over the last one. That's not saying much. I know. A lot of times it's all by comparison. So if you had shown me this devoid of the previous one, I'd probably mark it less. But it's it's okay. It feels more Tales from the Crypt than not. But it's just not very good. I mean, the, the first of all, the makeup is weird. It's it, you know the makeup for this entire season has been off. They seem to be doing like relying on just sort of I'm assuming television level makeup artists, whereas. In America, it was like, you know, a team not necessarily run by Kevin Yeager for every single episode. But when you think about makeup art, like, I know who Kevin Yeager is. Like, I couldn't tell you who did the makeup in this. Like, didn't stand out. I, you know, I don't know. It's it, it's okay. Anna Friel is good uh, in the role. She's one of those actors who seemed like they were going to be big for a little while. They, 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 they got a lot of roles like that. But I think the last thing I saw her in was that Land of the Lost remake with Will Ferrell, which was awful. I think she's good, but... You know, it's okay. It's it's good as like a little bit of a shocker, I suppose. Like, okay, this is a haunt of fear. Twenty seven, written by Carl Wessler, uh, drawn by Graham Engels. The story is effectively the same. It doesn't sort of have the the take on like this priest and his wife. Like that's not in the original comic. The original comic is just a guy. And he's married to his wife, and she gives birth to twins, and they tell him that one twin is so horrible that he should never see it. And then, <laughs> and then the comic goes fifteen years later, and and which is just ludicrous because how would you not see both of your daughters at one time in fifteen years, uh, no matter how uh, stringent the wife is in keeping you from them? And then. He decides that he needs to kill the one so that the other one can be happy or something. I don't know. It's really bad. I view the episode as an improvement over the last episode and as an improvement of the source material. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's that great. I mean, what do you think, Chris? It's bad. I mean, it's just not good. It's Again, it's another one of these love triangle stories with a twist that comes out of nowhere, that adds nothing, that ultimately makes me question what was the point of telling this story if this was always going to be the twist. I just am so sick of this. Tw the twist in this show just not having a purpose. 
And then you have these poor actors in the show, like Imelda Staunton, who's a great actress. And she's just sitting here, like, looking at the screen, like, help me. I'm being held hostage. Yeah, I did like, I mean, I like the interplay when the, the bad twin would sort of come out and menace them. Like, I thought that was, I thought that was pretty good. But it, the, as you said, the, the twist is eventually just predicated on a deformity. And, like, that's enough of a, a shock. And is it? No. Like, I'm not saying it needed to be more but it kind of needed to be more yeah i would agree i i think it i think it needed i think it needed something i it needed something to offset how generic the setup felt oh you have a sleazy priest man we never seen that one before oh and he's you know going around and acting more pious than everyone else but it turns out he actually has two daughters man this is such a unique story that you're telling. Yeah, it's really somebody who, you know, wanted to take a jab at organized religion. And I don't have any problem with that as long as it's something original. And this was not it, exactly what you said. Like, oh, my God, this guy is actually like a licentious prick and he preaches the gospel. Like, h- how many times have we seen that? Like, you know, a million times. Exactly. That's exactly it. And it, it just, it doesn't, it, what, like, the story is so not even the caliber of Tales from the Crypt at all. At all. It's not a, it's not a caliber of even, the, like, even the, some of the stories that they were telling in season six, this is so much more generic than this show deserves. Yeah, if, if you know, we had to subtitle this entire season, it's, these actors deserved better. We, and we've said that for previous seasons, certainly, but it's always an, on an individual basis. Like, we, there are highs and lows, and in the lows we tend to commiserate with the actor who had to portray the part. But here it's like every single episode, it's like, wow, these are good people. Like, I'm excited to watch them do their thing, but they're not given anything character-wise. And ultimately, if they were just ciphers as characters and the plot was interesting, then we could root for that. But they kind of uh, cut their legs out from under them at the (sighs) (laughs) get-go. What can we tell you, folks? Yeah, I I think my exasperation with this season is really... I'm disappointed by the fact that it was all true, the things I really didn't remember about season seven, because I had seen it. I just didn't remember it. Mm -hmm. Man... Like I, I, this really is the worst season of the show. Yeah, it it kind of is, and without a without comparison. Yeah, it's stultifying. It's shocking how just kind of across the board, it's the most rote tales from the crypt stories you could imagine. And on top of everything else, you have characters who are being written. In such a way that the actors who are portraying them are having to essentially just look around and ask themselves, like, why am I even doing this show? They're, 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 the, scri- the scripts are not even giving these actors anything to do. Yeah, ultimately, uh, very disappointing. It's wild. It's, it's, it's wild how cheap the show looks now. It's wild how poor the writing is. It's wild how poor the directing is, how it all looks like a set. It all looks very set bound now. Like, man, it, it, the, the stark contrast from season six to seven is just it's so I didn't think it was going to be this obvious. But man, it was it's it's been obvious and just and slowly declining. Yeah. You know, the first couple episodes of the season, they were avoiding some of those pitfalls. They seemed to be out on location and uh, it was uh, interesting looking. And even if the uh, episode wasn't spectacular, there was some good visuals going on. But it. It's like this slow decline where any little joys you could snatch from some of the earlier parts of the season are now stripped away entirely. And now it's everything I don't like about Tales from the Crypt. Like you said, like to me, no matter the story, if it's shot well, I'm going to at least derive a pleasure from that, that it doesn't look like it's a bunch of actors standing on a sound stage and it's overlit. And, you know, you get the sense when you see something like that, that everyone's just waiting for lunchtime, you know, and in these past few episodes and obviously on into the future, it's been kind of a drag how workmanlike it's been. It's funny because like, you know, if the plot's not good and it's shot well, then I can kind of give it a pass. Or if it's like a really well-written episode and the production value ain't great, then I'll give that a pass. But this is this is aiming for the the first baseline. It's not, you know, it's like they're not swinging at anything here. They're just sort of, everyone seems to be cashing a check. And what's a particular drag about that is, you know, these are a lot of really good actors. And in, in some cases, actors who 
hadn't yet kind of made it. So you know they're hungry for this kind of a role uh, where they get to like do their stuff and then they're not really given anything to do. So they just sort of go back into anonymity until their big break. This could have been their big break had the series supported them in a way. Oh, I completely agree. I mean, that's that seems to be, for me, the, the biggest kind of shame of this show is just like how how much it is wasting the time of people who need this kind of work. And like you said, these people are, they want to be successful. You know, I mean, good Lord. You know, Imelda Stanton, she wasn't the star that she was then or now. She wasn't then that she wasn't the star then that she's now. Neither was Ewan McGregor. Yeah. Or Ewan McGregor, Daniel Craig. And it's like, Jesus Christ, Steve Coogan, like Eddie Izzard is in an episode coming up. Like this, you know, there's a lot of, really good talent on the way or you know that we had gotten but ill served yeah 100 percent. and i mean in the new in the in the next episode we talk about is that the one that has uh it's the one that has eddie izzard and siren hines um and alan armstrong it's probably not gonna be good <laughs> oh you'll have to tune in and see <laughs> Don't get your hopes up. So uh, until that episode where we talk about episode 11 and 12, because I figure we leave the final episode for its own episode, just like we left the first episode its own episode. Where can people find you, Father Malone? You can check me out at fathermalone.com. I got links there to all of the cuckoo things that I do, including my radio drama, Dark Destinations. It's a monthly radio drama. You can also, uh, using fathermalone.com, get to the other podcast that Chris and I do with uh, our good friend Mike White, which is Dreams for Sale, the Twilight Zone 85 podcast. And as for me, you can find me on Twitter at Christmas Claus. That's where I am. That's where I'll be. I do the Culture Cast, a couple other podcasts. You can find out all about them over on my Twitter. Big thanks, as always, to John Kassir for doing the intro to the podcast, and we'll catch you on the next episode.